kingdom program, friends, would require participation and not spectating. But here's a problem that we have as a big C church is that very few people want to participate while others simply want to spectate. And, and can I say this? You did not get saved to sit. You got saved to be sent. And what do we see Jesus do with his apostles as we get to verses 13 to 19? That he trains them, he equips them, and he sends them. If all you do is come to church every Sunday, but yet you are not being a participant, you've missed it. All right. Well, let's go ahead and find our seats, everybody, as we get started tonight. Let's go ahead and find our seats so we can begin tonight's study. How's everybody doing? Good? Good? Awesome. Uh, so tonight is going to be really cool because we're going to be doing pretty much a summary over what we've gone through thus far as we dive into Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. So uh, again, I'll, as I prepare to kind of do a recap, um, you can go ahead and set your Bibles up, whether you're on your phone or if you have your physical Bibles, you can go ahead and open those up to Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And as I mentioned, uh, we're going to begin by reading the scriptures. Usually I do a recap, but we're going to begin by reading the scriptures together um, as the text is really going to lead us to a summary over what we've witnessed in our study through the gospel of Mark to date. And the text will be a bit of a transitioning and summarizing point regarding Jesus's ministry, as we will see next week that it's going to eventually lead to Jesus selecting his 12 apostles. So that's where we'll be at next week. So uh, what I felt like the Lord wanted us to do, especially with what I see in the text, is that there's this pause that we're going to have as we look back and as we anticipate what Jesus will be doing with his apostles moving forward. So with that being said, let's go ahead and read together Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. And this is the reading of the word of the Lord. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd, so, they could, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many, with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. That's the reading of the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time once again that we have to spend with you. Lord, the time that you are our teacher, that as we open up the word of God, that as we break bread together in the scriptures, Lord, that you will open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law. You will open up our minds that we'll be able to understand the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you allow the Holy Spirit to burn within our hearts as you lead us to know you more, to love you more deeply, that our affections may be stirred up to see Jesus all the more clearly. Lord, I pray, Father God, that as we dive in tonight's text, that you will bring to our remembrance, Lord, things that we may have forgotten, Lord, so that those things will be able to be better understood as we move forward in this study, because it's all pointing to you. Lord, now I ask that you hide me behind your cross. May you be seen. May you be heard. May your presence be felt. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that you will allow us to grow to become effectual doers of your word. 
and not simply hearers that delude themselves. For it is in the doing of the word that we are blessed. And finally, Lord, what we know not will you teach us. Lord, what we have not will you give us. And who we are not will you make us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. So in in previous teachings, again, I mentioned that Mark's gospel account is one of brevity. It's one of brevity. Uh, The way in which it's structured is similar to a short summary snippet that contains what I would consider to be a big picture focus, a big picture focus, somewhere, somewhere similar to that of Cliff Notes. For Mark's audience, who are, again, primarily Roman believers in the midst of oppression from Nero, there is no time for this lengthy, drawn-out detail, similar to what some of the other synoptic gospels afford. Rather, there is a need for a large summary format that is going to crystallize the centrality and the authority of Christ and his work. One could compare, really, Mark's gospel to that of a movie trailer. It provides short clips of action-packed information that further draws the reader into greater desire of God's gospel. And obviously, as we know, it's first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 15. And really, the objective of a movie trailer is quite simple. It is to capture the attention of its audience in an effort to draw them to the actual movie, right? A movie trailer maybe at max is 60 seconds. The movie up ends being around an hour and 30 to two hours. So the trailer does not provide the full experience of the picture. It simply provides glimmers of anticipation, which leads to full enjoyment in the experience. And if we were friends to imagine for a moment Thus far in our study, we've experienced several of these movie trailers or several of these glimpses, if you will, of the fullness of Jesus' person and his work. And each trailer provides us with yet another dimension of Jesus' authority, another dimension of his power as he is moving throughout the Galilee. So again, it's going to provide us this opportunity to see glimpses of the glory of our great God. And not only that, but will also allow us to see him in his humanity. It will be here in Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, that Mark provides a bit of a parenthetical pause to reflect on the growing influence and greatness of Jesus' ministry. This pause really is going to give way to some of the growing conflicts that Jesus has been facing as it pertains to his engagement with that of the Pharisees, the scribes of the Pharisees, and what we discovered last week, the Herodians. And it's at this point that I want to now do what I'm going to simply call a textual recap. And we're going to go all the way back to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to do a quick synopsis right on through, because we need to understand where Mark is bringing us to here at Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. The reason why I mention this is because this particular part of the text, verses 7 through 12, is a very pivotal moment as it is going to point us to the interactions that Jesus will have with the religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with the Herodians, as he is in a compliment with his apostles. Now, with that being said, let's, let's rewind time. If you recall, we began with what I considered in the beginning of our study, the thesis statement of Mark's gospel, the thesis statement of Mark's gospel. And we found that in Mark chapter one, verse one. And Mark explains really at the top of this gospel account that this very gospel begins with one man. It begins with one man. It begins with the God man the Son of God, whose name is Jesus Christ. We learn that this reality of Jesus as the Son of God was not just a New Testament phenomenon. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ as the Son of God is a matter, friends, of eternality. 
It's a matter of eternality. That Christ has always existed and always will be forever all the more. John chapter 17 verse 5 tells us this. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Friends, Jesus was in the beginning with the Father. He's not a created being. He was always there. He always existed. We see this assurance in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 and 14. What does that say? Well, it simply says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten son. You see, Jesus being the very incarnational reality of the very word of God was always a part of God's redemptive plan regarding salvation for men and women. As a matter of fact, if that wasn't good enough for you, Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three is going to even take that to another level regarding the fact that Jesus was always a part of this redemptive plan. This is what Hebrews chapter one, verses one through three says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us, here it is, by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Verse three, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Clearly, Jesus always existed. He is not a created being. He is the being that creates all things. And now we see again, Mark chapter one, verse one, more specifically verses two to three, that Mark provides a combined quotation. And this combined quotation is really rooted in the book of Isaiah in the Hebrew scriptures. It is Isaiah the prophet that is mentioning by the power of the Holy Spirit that there would be a forerunner that would come to introduce Messiah to the stage. And we found out that immediately after that particular excerpt that John the Baptist was the one, in fact, who pops on the scene. As a matter of fact, after verses two and three of Mark chapter one, the text tells us, and John the Baptist came on the scene. It's almost this immediately type of response. And John the Baptist comes on the scene and the text tells us that he's proclaiming something that the father gave him in order to proclaim to those who would come to eventually know Messiah. And that message was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message, friends, began to grasp the attention of many people in the surrounding areas. And as we move into actually expositing verses 7 through 12, you're going to see that there's some parallelism regarding the the growing following that John the Baptist had. And then you're also going to see this large multitude of following with those who are following Jesus. And it's then in Mark chapter 1 verse 9 that we see that Uh, that Jesus comes on the scene to be baptized by John. And it's here that John receives both a verbal and visual confirmation that Jesus is in fact the long-awaited Messiah. It is at this point that Jesus is then thrusted into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. Ultimately, it proves one simple thing, that Jesus is the perfect, spotless God, man, he is the Messiah. And after Jesus leaves the wilderness, his ministry would begin to come forth. Only understand that his ministry comes forth after John the Baptist is taken into custody. If you recall, I mentioned this word kairos, this Greek word kairos, it's it's different from chronos. Chronos is a chronological time. Kairos is an exact moment in time. And we found that John the Baptist being taken into custody and Jesus beginning his ministry was a kairotic moment. It was a moment that within God's redemptive plan leads to Jesus's ministry being able to lift off. And from this point, Jesus begins the recruitment of his first hand pick of what will soon become 
apostles. If you recall, those first four disciples were who? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And all four of these men were what? They were fishermen. So Jesus, with these four individuals, are now beginning to walk and do ministry together. Jesus is teaching, and they come to a synagogue. And it's at this particular synagogue that as people are beginning to listen to Jesus, they're noticing something that is different from all the other rabbis. That as Jesus is beginning to teach, he's teaching with one with authority one with authority like no other. And this appeal of authority is accompanied right after they're seeing how marvelous he is at the way in which he's enabled to interpret the text. It then moves to now a situation with a demon-possessed person. And it's here at this point that this demon-possessed person is then exercised by Jesus. Jesus expels him, and then they marvel and are in amazement all the more. And this appeal really of authority that is seen and is witnessed by Jesus, Peter sees this as Jesus' bread and butter. I mean, Jesus, I mean, this is what you came for, right? Like, you're the man. Nobody's doing what you're doing. And it would be through these healings that Jesus would be doing over time that the religious leaders would move from an observant state to an interrogative state. This reality is further realized in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, where we witness the first messianic miracle. What did Jesus do there? Well, Jesus healed the first ever Jewish leper. This was unheard of. And as one could imagine, news of that caliber and of that magnitude began to spread like wildfire, especially because the the man that was struggling with leprosy didn't obey Jesus. And he began to go and tell everybody, listen, listen, I've been healed. I no longer have leprosy. And after this healing, we then begin to see Jesus continuing on this healing crusade, right? And the next individual that comes about is the paralytic man paralytic man comes to Peter's home. Obviously, there's a crowd that is pressing around him. He can't go through. So what do you do after that? You have a demolition project on the roof. They open up the roof. They bring the man down and they set him before Jesus. And this scene, if you can recall, was quite intriguing. Why? Because Jesus speaks first to the spiritual needs of the man. He does not speak to the man's physical needs. Ultimately, outlining that Jesus' coming was meant to provide way for men and women to first be made right with God. Then everything else can follow. It would make sense for Jesus to heal this man but be sent to hell because he didn't come to have his sins forgiven. You can walk all around hell, but all because you missed Your sins being forgiven was the point that Jesus was making. And it is this, again, rising action in the text that leads to Jesus becoming the target of more incessant investigation and aggravation. And all of this, friends, continues to grow. Jesus continues to handpick more men. We see the next person that he picks is a tax collector named Matthew. And these men that Jesus is picking as he's been walking along this journey, these men aren't scholarly. These are ordinary, unlearned men. They are not your seminary grads. They are not your master's uh, students. Your, they don't have a bachelor. No, these are just your regular, average, hardworking folks who just want to be available. In other words, friends, Jesus is not willing, nor is Jesus wanting to look for men that feel qualified in the sense of what they do. He's not worried about their works. But rather, he wants to take men that are nothing in the eyes of society, and he wants to make them something by his power and by his authority. And I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to see that in next week's teaching as it pertains to the recruitment of these disciples as Jesus names all 12 of them. I want to speak a little bit further to this point here. If you notice 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27, what does the text tell us? It tells us this, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. So again, the big deal is not about you being the right fit is about Jesus making you the right fit. 
Well, again, we'll see more details on that next week. Towards the end of Mark chapter 2, Jesus begins to push the envelope directly towards the religious leaders. Jesus brings to light the goal of the Sabbath versus that of the traditions of men. More specifically, in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus makes the jaw-dropping statement that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So that's where we've been at up to that point. Now we arrive to where we were last week. Again, fast synopsis, fast summary. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is where Jesus' demonstration of what it means to be Lord of the Sabbath became the primary cause of conspiring to end Jesus' life. It would be because of this growing hardness of hearts that the Pharisees are experiencing that that would now include the Herodians in this conspiring against Jesus to destroy him. And we, you know, we mentioned last week that up until this point, that the Herodians were never mentioned up until this point in Mark's gospel, up until this point, right? And, and I mentioned that because Jesus' influence in this region of the Galilee is growing so much that not only is it impacting the religious area, right? The religious sphere. But now for the Herodians, it's beginning to become a bit political. Now, when I'm talking about politics, I'm not talking Democrat, Republican. I'm simply talking to the fact that they had the authority in the Roman government at that time, ro ruling in these particular jurisdictions. There were four major areas that they were ruling in. And so the only way in which the Herodians and the Pharisees could stop what Jesus was doing in this gaining of influence was to kill the emerging yet eternally existing king. If there was a section of our current study that would really summarize the growing frustration and consternation of the Pharisees, it would be this, Mark chapter 2, verses 21 through 22. And this is how it reads. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and the skins as well. But one, here it is, puts new wine into fresh wine skins. So this new way that Jesus is proclaiming, is teaching, and is demonstrating is confronting and now exposing Pharisaical Judaism and false religion square in the face. And this would ultimately now pave the way for the new covenant or the new error that Jesus is bringing in to cause the shadow of the old covenant to pass away, to be fulfilled. We talked about that Greek word telos. It literally means the goal. What is the goal? And Jesus fulfilled that in order for the new covenant, the new wineskins to come into play. Friends, ultimately salvation would not be through means of having a constantly sacrificial thing that the purpose was never for them to have to constantly sacrifice and present their sacrifices before the priests and do this over and over again. It became habitual. It wouldn't be, again, through righteous deeds, their attempt at righteousness. We, we, we discovered earlier that no man is righteous. No, not one. The only one that is righteous is Jesus Christ himself. Nor would salvation be able to come through pride and arrogance wouldn't be able to come through that. But friends, it would be provided. Salvation would be provided through, in, and by the suffering servant and King Jesus Christ, dying once for all and placing upon us his divine righteousness. The response from the Jewish leaders and the Herodians would have really been a foretelling of what would lie ahead for Jesus as they're conspiring to kill him. That death was the destination point for Jesus for the sake of salvation for those who would come in salvation. 
But this is the beautiful thing. Despite the conflict and the controversy amongst the Herodians and the Pharisees, I love this because I think it's really indicative of the big C church, that Jesus' ministry continues to increase in following. I think if we see anything thus far from what we've summarized here is that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Now with that whole summary over Mark 1, 1 to this point, Mark 3, 7 through 12, we now will dive into verse 7 and 8 together. So this is what it says. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples and a large multitude from Galilee followed and also from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard about everything that he was doing and came to him. So it's after Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees in the synagogue regarding the matters of healing on the Sabbath that Mark tells us that Jesus at that point withdrew and he withdrew to the Sea of Galilee. However, understand Jesus' withdrawing does not come without the immense following of men and women from throughout the region. The text mentions to us that there was a large multitude from several regions who are accompanying Christ, who are following Christ. And from the location of the synagogue to the Sea of Galilee, Scripture does not provide us with the details on travel time or from which direction Jesus is coming from. Nor is Mark's focus here on which synagogue Jesus was attending and coming from, but rather the locations of where people are coming from. Do you see that in the text? That, that's the effort that Mark is trying to make mention here. Where are the people coming from? Who are the people? What's their region? What's their location? So two things become really evidently clear thus far in our study at this point. First, Jesus' ministry has become threatening by both religious and political leaders. It's kind of our first point here. That the religious leaders are ticked off. Because Jesus is interpreting and teaching with an authority like no other. And here it is that the Pharisees, using the Mishnah and the Talmud, are creating more and more obstacles for people to hop, jump, and skip in order to look, feel, and think that they are more righteous. Ultimately, Jesus is alluding to the reality that the Mishnah and the Talmud are not the Mosaic law. It does not point you to what thus saith the Lord. And we'll eventually see as you walk into the new covenant with Jesus, him being the new wine, that as you walk with him, you will begin to see what this new way is. Later on in the New Testament, you begin to see that Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. So that is what we begin to see. Secondly, Jesus' ministry following has not been stifled despite the combative efforts of the Pharisees and scribes of the Pharisees. Even with the immense pressure that is coming for Jesus, even with the conspiring that is happening behind his back in order to find ways in which to kill him, Jesus doesn't tuck tail and run and says, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. He presses in. See, some people think that we, we have, oftentimes have this picture of Jesus holding the lamb with his head tilted to the side, petting the lamb. Jesus is a man's man. Jesus is a, is a tough guy. He doesn't play games. He doesn't tuck and run. And as we witnessed from last week's teaching, Jesus' reasoning for withdrawing back to the Sea of Galilee was not on his own prerogative. Check out what, again, Mark chapter 3, verse 6, this is what it says. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him, here it is, as to how they might put him to death. So it, it only makes sense that if one's life is in grave danger, that to prevent a premature death of Messiah, you would, in fact, withdraw to a safer location. And in this case, that area, the text tells us, is the Sea of Galilee, close to the town where he is headquartered, which, as you guys probably know by now, is Capernaum. And in this case, 
This area was, again, the sea. That's where it's headquartered. But what becomes really a true encouragement in this text? Again, and I've probably mentioned to it before, but it goes, again, without saying that although the pressure is pounding, the ministry continues to go. What may look, friends, as a withdrawal from the pressures and the vicissitudes of life at that time for Jesus and his followers, it is really pushing the gospel further. If you ever look into church history and you look at how the church has been persecuted over time, time and time again, it looks like you have this dipping moment, but the church always bounces back. I mean, just look at church history over and over again. You see the church thrive over and over. Now, the question can become this, just how far reaching has Jesus's ministry become at this point of his ministry? So he's having some successes as he's going to different places. But truly, how dynamic is his ministry at this time amongst persecution? Well, Mark chapter 3, verse 7b into verse 8 gives us a look into the areas in which Jesus' ministry has spread by word of mouth. Here's some of the areas of ministerial impact. I'm going to go over those regions again. The Galilee... Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. Now, me just saying that really is not going to make any sense unless we see a map here. And as you can see, the map here, I've kind of circled around the areas here. Now, I know you can't see it, but I want you to know if this particular area down here is Idumea, We have the Judea region here. Jerusalem is located right here where the arrow is. We have Perea, which is to the east of the Jordan, the Jordan that leads further down here into the Dead Sea. Uh, So so we have the Galilee here up at this region. And right where this yellow, this green marker here, that's where Capernaum is. Okay, so again, just to kind of let see the lay of the land. Now, I want to break down here what these regions are and what are the populations of this region. Okay, so again, typically within this time, during this time, Jews typically came from the Galilee, they came from Judea, and they came from Jerusalem. Okay. That's where you see a majority of your Jewish people coming from. Okay. Then you would have a mix of Jews and Gentiles from Idumea. And the mixture of Gentile and Jew, again, is in Idumea here in the southern area of Judea in this location. And also it's important to note that Idumea really played an important role in the military conflicts of the Second Temple period. The text then is also going to mention beyond the Jordan, right? Beyond the Jordan. And this region, according to our map, would put that on the east of the Jordan right here. So here is Perea. And interestingly enough, Herod Antipas is widely known to be the ruler of that particular region. Now you may notice here, and you can't see it on the map, but there are some little yellow dots. Do you guys see that? Okay. So these small little yellow dots with the black dot inside, these are areas which are considered to be Herodian fortresses. So this is where the Herodian dynasty was ruling. They had set up their areas of authority. And so as you can see, it is highly populated. So when we go back and we think about verse 6 regarding the Herodians coming into this ploy to kill Jesus, you can see obviously that Jesus' influence was vast. It was quite large. Okay. Now, m- m- keep on. I want to keep moving on here. Lastly, I want us to notice the text mentions the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, right up here in the region of Phoenicia. You see that right here? This area, um, known as Phoenicia, was a strictly Gentile area. Strictly a Gentile area. So we have this mixture of strictly Jewish areas, a mixture of Jewish and Gentile areas, and then strictly Gentile. Now, if I had another graphic or a marker board, I would write it because there's a very 
strong line that can be connected here. And this is the reason why I bring that up. There's a reason why Mark is presenting, he's presenting these particular regions for us to see and their populations in this order. And this really comes back to a question that someone posed last week regarding how did Gentiles get into the fold? Like were Gentiles an afterthought? Like how did this work? Well, again, notice the way in which Mark begins to outline these regions, it starts off strictly Jewish. Then it begins to become what? A little mixture of Jew and Gentile. And then it becomes fully Gentile. What do you think the picture that the text is painting as we're walking through it? We talked about it in Romans 1 verse 15, that the gospel goes to who first? To the Jew. And then it goes to who next? to the Gentile. So as you see the movement of the, 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 the geography, we see that they first are hearing it amongst the Jews. And then this knowledge then begins to move to some Jews and Gentiles. And then now all of a sudden the Gentiles are hearing this news. Wes, where do you, what are you connecting the dots here? I don't, I don't get it. Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. We'll read it together. Go ahead and turn there. It's going to begin to bring about this redemptive salvific work that's happening. Again, Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. This is what it reads. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Here's verse 18 through 21. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And here's verse 21. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. So Matthew's gospel provides really a shift in this kingdom proclamation by quoting from Isaiah chapter 42, which foretold the Messiah's rejection. Isaiah chapter 42 foretold again the Messiah's rejection. And it moves from Jesus proclaiming who he is and the kingdom that he is coming to bring to now it becoming about a kingdom program that is going to be rolled out. And Matthew's gospel mentions that the program will move forward without Israel for a time and commence with the Gentiles. Now remember, the gospel, as I've mentioned before, is first to the Jew. But yet we are seeing nationally that Israel nationally is beginning to do what? They are rejecting Messiah. This eventually would lead to what you and I know now as the church age or the age of the Gentiles. And you see more of that as you begin to walk through the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you see Cornelius and Peter. Cornelius becomes saved, he and his entire household. The exchange that happens between Peter and Cornelius is interesting. If you actually read it, what happens is Peter comes to Cornelius' house, and I paraphrase, of course, Peter says, what am I doing here? I, I, I don't even need to be around you. We, we, we have no dealings with each other. And what's interesting is at the time that Peter had a vision from the Lord, Cornelius also had a vision from the Lord, which brought Peter to Cornelius' house. And at that moment, it was where Peter is able to share the gospel. Cornelius and his household get saved. And what is the authentication factor? He speaks in tongues. He speaks in a known language that is authenticating what? What the Jews have already experienced. So when Peter sees Cornelius speak in a, unknown, in a known language, what ends up happening? He says, listen, this is in fact a move of God. God is moving not just with the Jews. He's also moving with the Gentiles. And friends, that's a beautiful thing. Because Israel was not going to be forsaken 
for their rejection because Messiah eventually is going to do what? Bring them back to himself. And within Isaiah 42, there's two euphemisms that are used to explain Messiah's grace and mercy to Israel nationally. Notice verse 20 of Matthew chapter 12. He says that Messiah wouldn't break off a battered reed, nor would Messiah put out a smoldering wick. Both phrases refer to making something out of nothing. Notice that a battered reed is useless just as much as a smoldering wick is. Both would naturally be given up, replaced, or thrown out. This would be what some would have assumed in that case if Israel had rejected Messiah. However, Isaiah says Messiah will make something out of nothing. Just as Jesus will bring the light to the Gentiles and make them his people, he will do the same for his chosen people, Israel. Friends, if you don't see it by now, this is a demonstration of God's grace and compassion that the religious leaders could not understand for themselves. But yet, Jesus representing both Israel nationally and humanity overall demonstrates grace and compassion towards the least of us all. This is grace redemptively realized. And friends, may I say this? This is why you and I should be in constant prayer for our Jewish brothers and sisters. That as you are praying for them, as we are praying for them, that they may, their hearts may be stirred to jealousy to see what God is doing. That they may come to know their Messiah. So it is through Jesus' amazing acts of power and teaching with authority and healings that has really begun to draw all of these people. And if you haven't been walking with us through Mark's gospel thus far, again, I'll just kind of highlight some things for you really quickly. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Jesus in the synagogue, he's teaching with authority. He's expelling demons. People are amazed at his teaching. Mark of chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. Jesus not only heals Peter, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, but he also is able to heal others who are demon-possessed. Thirdly, we see Mark chapter 1, verse 39. We witness Jesus continuing to heal those who are demon-possessed, and he's continuing to share the gospel of God. We also see Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. Jesus heals a Jewish leper. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, Jesus heals the paralytic man. And then lastly, again, Mark 3, 1 through 6, Jesus heals the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. So as you can imagine, from knowing what we've seen from Mark 1, 1, all the way to Mark 3 to date, that there's been many events, many trailers of God's power, of God's authority, demonstrated and evidently seen. This is what is causing many people in these regions to discover who he is. Again, as I mentioned, Peter would have wanted him to just stop here. Like, Lord, you're known all the way entire inside. And I mean, come on, you're this amazing guy. Jesus, again, if you recall in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus really nicely lets him know, Peter, this is not why I came. I came for a reason, and it's not just to entertain you with these healings. It, it's not to do that. Jesus has come so that individuals may know why he came, rather than what he can do. And it's here, friends, that we really discover a pertinent question. It's a question that I pose to all of us and you online watching. And that is this, what is one's cause for following Christ? What is one's cause for following Christ? The deeper question really is this, what truly distinguishes a true believer of Jesus from someone who had an emotional response? And I think this is really an issue with the big C church universally. 
that we believe that everybody that comes into a church service or sits in a pew at a Bible study is somehow saved. That is the biggest mistake to make, is to make the assumption that because the seats are filled, that all are saved. We tend to equate church attendance with people being true followers of Jesus, people being saved. However, the quantitative number can equally reflect people who simply want to know Jesus for what Jesus can do for them. For Jesus, individuals simply see him as a genie that they can solicit help or advice from while all the while refusing to truly accept him as Lord and as Messiah. Lord, I just want you for the things that you can do for me. You know, I don't really want to like, I just want to. But for those friends in whom the Lord calls, it is an unwavering drawing to the king. You cannot help but to be drawn by God. And this is the difference between a believer in Christ and someone who's just caught up in emotionalism saying, oh, I felt goosebumps on this song. Song may have been great. I mean, don't get me wrong. It may have been a hymnal, right? But the hymnal doesn't save you. Christ does. So what is, again, what is it getting to? It's getting to the matters of the heart, And here's the reality that those who were following Jesus from these areas, some may have genuinely been following because of the message that they heard. But there was also a majority of people who were simply following Jesus because of what he could do for them. To better articulate really this this heaviness of this multitude, this this crowd, I, I want to look at verses 9 through 10 of Mark 3. Check out the text with me. And he told his disciples to see that a boat would be ready for him because of the masses so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had diseases pushed in around him in order to touch him. Mark's account makes it really apparent from the previous verses that the multitudes are coming to be healed whether for physical ailments that they're going through or if they're demonically possessed, that there is obviously from the text a great need. People are in need of relief. And the crowd here in the text becomes a barrier of sorts regarding this need versus those who are simply there to spectate and see Jesus. Now, this may sound a bit familiar because we witness the same exact thing with the paralyzed man at Peter's home. Who was blocking the way? The Pharisees. So they had to curtail the Pharisees in order to get to Jesus. And here, friends, in lies the same exact situation, that there are people that are coming, some to spectate, and some of those genuinely wanting to be able to get close to Jesus because they have a true, genuine need. You see, there was an issue regarding a great need, but there was also an impediment because of a great crowd. The only resolve here in this case was for Jesus to get on a boat so that he would not be physically overwhelmed and crowded. Now, this type of boat was not your typical boat. This this wasn't a boat that typically you would have fishermen get the, the catch of the day. That's not what it was. The Greek word for boat here is pluerion. It it, it is a small boat. It's a skiff. This type of boat would be similar to a a rowboat. So in order to better grasp really the intensity of Jesus needing to have this boat on the ready by his disciples, we really need to understand the Greek language that is happening here regarding the crowd. Regarding the crowd. Now, understand that this sense of crowding that is happening here in the text is really beyond waiting in line at Universal Studios or Six Flags and those long lines that you have to wait as it's hot outside and it's scorching and you're packed like sardines. That's not that kind of crowding. It's more intense. 
check this out. The, the, the word for crowd here is thelebo, which, which means pressing or crushing. All of these people coming from all of these different regions wanting to come and see Jesus. It wasn't just, I'm standing in line, oh, you're healed next, oh, you're healed next, like it's people see you the Pope. No, that's not what it was. It was literally this, all folks coming and trying to press in and literally crushing each other. Friends, there are desperate needs waiting to be met by a multitude of people. Understand, however, that this pressing and this sense of desperation is not a demonstration of faith. I'm going to say that again. Their pressing and coming to Jesus was not a demonstration of faith, but rather it was a need of relief. We're desperate, Lord. We need help. One could imagine really the sense that, and the need rather, for help that Jesus would have needed in his humanity. All of these people coming, all of these demands from all these people, and I'm one person. Understand, I'm not taking away the deity of Jesus. Obviously, if he wanted to heal all of them in a snap of a finger, he could. But there's a humanity aspect in the person of Christ regarding the compassion and meeting the needs of people. And Jesus could not meet all of their needs simultaneously. So what does this come about? Well, it it really brings about what we're going to see next week, starting in verse 13, regarding the recruitment of the apostles. That there was going to need to be shared leadership. And in order for these men who are going to be following Jesus to know what is needed to be done, how to heal others, how to meet the needs of others, they would have to walk with Jesus. He would have to spend intimate amounts of time with these men in order for them to be taught. The leadership of this kingdom program would need to expand. Understand that Jesus is going to be the object of the affection and the attention. Although you will see later on in the gospel account that they're going to be disciples. They're going to ask, well, who's the greatest? Am I going to be the greatest? And here he goes again. No, you, you missed the point. That's not what it's about. And, and I'm probably going to get into a little bit of next week's message right now, but pardon me if I do. Understand this. Discipleship is not about you. If you are the center of your disciple making, then you've completely missed the point of disciple making. Because disciple making points you to the very person that called you, that has saved you, that has redeemed you. That's what it's about. The kingdom program, friends, would require participation and not spectating. And again, I know I'm I'm teasing on the universal church, but I love the church. I love the universal church. And I want our church universally to be well. But here's a problem that we have as a big C church. Is that very few people want to participate. While others simply want to spectate. And and can I say this? You did not get saved to sit. You got saved to be sent. And what do we see Jesus do with his apostles as we get to verses 13 to 19? That he trains them, he equips them, and he sends them. If all you do is come to church every Sunday, but yet you are not being a participant, you've missed it. I will dare to even say this, that you've missed Jesus. Because Jesus came to earth, wrapped himself in flesh, and got his hands dirty. So why do you think that you shouldn't be getting your hands dirty too? I stop. Okay. Back away. <laughs> Keep moving, Wes. Keep moving. <laughs> so again, as demand is continuing to grow, relief is needed. And again, it's going to require leadership. All right, let's keep moving. Verses 11 through 12. 
Again, we're going to have this other run in with unclean spirits. Check out the text with me. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. And he strongly warned them not to reveal who he was. So understand that demonic spirits inhabiting men and women during this time was not unfamiliar. As a matter of fact, there are many scholars and historians that say this was a very reoccurring thing that happened during that time. And all the more, as Jesus comes on the scene, you can imagine that that havoc is being taken all the more. And we witnessed Jesus' handling of the situation the first time in the synagogue. Again, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. And what did Jesus do there? Not only did he teach and have this great authority, but he demonstrated authority over the demonic realm. That, that, that hadn't been done before. Literally shutting up the mouths of the demoniacs and literally casting them out. Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, Luke tells us regarding that particular portion that as Jesus expelled the demon, that the man's body was not injured. Friends, this speaks to dominion that God has, that, that even when it comes down to the very hairs on that man's head, that it wasn't touched. Why? Because Jesus was in the room, Jesus had the control, and Jesus had the authority. And I think for you and I as believers, that should be confidence for us. And as we dove in deeper into this section of scripture, we saw that demons knew exactly who Jesus was. After the demonic spirits, uh, the unclean spirits saw the very authority and power that Jesus was demonstrating to the people, the text tells us that the unclean spirit recognized him. For some people, the question would be this. Well, why would the demons recognize Jesus, but Everybody else didn't. I mean, you're seeing all this stuff. You're seeing them teach with authority. It, why didn't they recognize him? And I'm not even talking about in Mark 1, 28. I'm talking about up to this point. Like, why are folks missing it? Well, simply put, friends, understand that demons witnessed the very glory and splendor of the pre-incarnate Christ in the presence of the Father before the fall to earth because of the rebellion. One third of the angels were knocked down. I talked about this a little bit in, in our teaching in Jude, that when it came down to the angels, a third of the angels being brought down from heaven and into the earth, that you have to imagine that they knew God's instructions. They knew God's power. They knew God's authority. They knew God's word. But yet in knowing and having all of this knowledge about God, yet they still disobeyed God. These demonic spirits, friends, understood that they were standing before who was standing before them was the second person of the Trinity. And that he was fulfilling the very instructions of God. Understand that as they're standing before him, as this unclean spirit is standing before Jesus, there is fear before them. If you don't believe me, James chapter 2 verse 19 tells us this. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. This is why the statement that the demoniac, the demonic spirit made in Mark 1 is so key for us to understand. I want to go back to it. Uh, Mark 1 verse 24. This is what it reads. Saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you, here it is, I would underline this. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. The unclean spirits knew that Jesus has the authority to destroy them once and for all. To ban them to the lake of fire. However, Jesus, like before, commands them to say nothing. Everything is in God's timing. It's not time for you to go to the lake of fire yet. But know it's coming soon. 
and I will be the one that banishes you there. Do you, do you feel the authority, the weightiness of Jesus? And we see a similar response here in our scriptures tonight. We, we just read through it. That Jesus rebukes the unclean spirits and forbids them to speak. Again, what is that doing? That's just, again, putting in stone the fact that Jesus has divine authority over the demonic realm. That although the unclean spirits knew the truth about Jesus, their testimony was to no credit of his person. I remember telling you guys a few weeks ago, unclean spirits and demonic spirits are not good character witnesses. So nobody is going to want to hear a demonic spirit say that Jesus is the son of God. Am I supposed to, really? Am I supposed to believe that? <laughs> what becomes really interesting as a takeaway from tonight is that although the demons recognize Jesus' authority, those in whom have been walking with him for some time, still don't quite yet know who he is. Isn't that interesting? Like even with people, you can know a person, but it takes time to truly get to know a person. And what we're going to see as the disciples, the apostles are walking with Jesus is not until later that Peter, by the unctioning of the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But still, even after that, what happens? We even see at the end, doubting Thomas has to ask Jesus, I just need to know if this is really you. And Jesus does what? He shows him his hands. So this comes to show you that there's this constant, um, I believe, but help my unbelief with them. And it's the same with us, even when we're walking with Jesus, Lord, I, I trust you in this, but I'm struggling to trust you in this. They see miracles, they see his authority, they see his demonstration, but yet they don't see Messiah. And what's really key for us to recognize is those in whom Jesus has called to himself, as I mentioned before, they don't see it. And, and I, I mentioned that because of this. Growing up, when I would be... Um, my mom would ask me, hey, I need you to go to the pantry and get this so I can cook. I'm like, I got you, especially for something really something good that my mom was going to cook. And so I would go to the pantry, and whatever item she would ask me for, I would open the pantry, and I'm looking. I'm like, Mom, I, I don't see what it is that you're asking me about. And my mom would always give this statement. She said, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. It's right here. And as Jesus' disciples continue to follow him, we are going to see, too, that they're going to have this moment as well. I've been walking with them, but I, I don't see it. But may I also bring an encouragement to you that, that God in his goodness still provided the grace for them to walk with him so that through time they would see and that their, their understanding of Jesus would grow all the more. Thank you, Lord. And friends, this is the evidence that we received tonight. The evidence that we've read about thus far. Jesus' power, his authority, his compassion, his goodness over the demonic realm, over creation. We have the evidence too. The question on the table is, do you believe what you've seen? Do you believe what it is that's been shown to you? The disciples had Jesus physically. We have his word. Do you believe what you've read? This historical, timeless truth right before our eyes. And next week, we're going to see that God's sovereign calling of his children require an active, inward working that brings us to full knowledge of him and his handiwork. And that 
it's going to require a sovereign election from a holy God by way of divine illumination requiring participatory transformation. And I pray next week, I'm super excited about it, that you will join us as we walk through the next few verses, verses 13 through 19, as we see Jesus naming, calling out his apostles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we have gone back through time textually to see your goodness and your power, that it blows our minds all the more. At each page that we turn in the gospel accounts reveals yet another dimension of your power, another dimension of your goodness, another dimension of your your greatness. And God, I ask that we may be able to enjoy um, and relish in your goodness, that we may be able to just truly sit in your presence, to eat of your word, as the psalmsters say, taste and see that the Lord is good, that you will continue, Father, to open our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law. Lord, I ask that you will continually create in us a clean heart that we might not sin against you. May we constantly be aware of our sin nature, that we may constantly give it to you, that we may seek you in all things, that you hold all power that allows us to overcome sin. Lord, your text tells us, greater is he that is within me than he who is in the world. That knowing that you are with us, that your Holy Spirit indwells us, that we we are able to overcome. And Lord, in our moments where we are, are struggling in, in understanding, will you help our unbelief in those ways? Will you help us to see you all the more clearly? We thank you. We praise you for tonight. And we give you all honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.